Hello and a warm welcome to Portfolio Watch with myself, Kukule Tumfuki. Now our topic today is David and Goliath. Small and mid caps have become increasingly attractive since fewer large caps have dominated the headlines. Now although the last year has seen small and mids move sideways and the top 40 up by 17%, this doesn't necessarily mean that the trend is likely to continue. Looking at the valuations on a broad level is also not the fairest way to assess the attractiveness of the different size buckets. Small isn't always risky, as big isn't always safe. Rather, try to identify good businesses that are mispriced and the rest will take care of itself. But to help us with regard to understanding the broad themes and, of course, particular stocks we should consider, I'm joined in studio by Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Gary Boyson, Director and Portfolio Manager at Rand Swiss. Gentlemen, a great pleasure to have you both with us. Gary, let's start off with you by really getting to understand the broad themes when it comes to um, small and mid caps that we've seen, particularly over the last year. Any particular insights that we need to be mindful of? <laughs> well, I think yeah, the, the, the thing that everyone's been, been sort of chatting about is, 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 the, is the fact that small mid caps in South Africa are very much South Africa ink stocks. So, mm. you know, with the, the kind of rumaphoria that we got at the beginning of the year, with the optimism kind of returning with the change of you know, at least the, the top le level leadership, uh, you know, perhaps these are, are suddenly you know very attractive buyers. And if you look at uh, kind of the company fundamentals, many of these companies have bunkered down. They've you know conserved their cash well. They've uh, you know and they are actually actually, as you said, fairly stable, you know, compared to some of the larger caps uh, and, and perhaps not the, the, the riskiest proposition when you look at kind of the margin of safety that they, they offer. And you know, with, with kind of the, the euphoria, we've seen a, a little bit of a pickup in these stocks. But I think the, the problem as well is that, uh, and I'm sure Andrew will say it, say it as well, is, you know, these stocks are often, you know, less liquid. They don't quite yeah. attract the, the kind of institutional buying because they, you know, institutions just can't get a, a meaningful stake in them. And they kind of end up, uh, you know, the domain of, uh, you know, the, the savvy private client investors. Yeah. Andrew, what are your thoughts on this, especially with regard to the SA exposure, that strong link between the South African economy and how these uh, stocks tend to perform? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we spoke a bit about it last week, actually, when we, when we mentioned the SA um, theme. And I think if you, you touched on it in the beginning when you spoke about large caps, you know, it's, if you just think Naspers, uh, Richmond and mm. Billiton, you know, those three shares on their own make up 40% of the South African market. And people focus on these large caps. They typically rand hedge. So when we've gone through difficult economic times like we have, and the rand's weakened, you know, through 2015, um, and then in 2016, everyone just thought that the rand's going to keep getting weaker and weaker, and hence you pile into these so-called rand hedge uh, large cap stocks. And very quickly, the small and mid cap space gets largely ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, institutional uh, managers can't really go into that space because if you're managing, you know, hundreds of billions of rands and you want to go and buy you know, 2%, 3% of your portfolio in a small cap stock or mid cap stock even, you're going to be buying the whole business. Yeah. You know, so that immediately results in the large managers you know, having to shop in the call it top 40 or maybe top 60 um, and not even looking at, at uh, your mid and small caps. Mm -hmm. As a result, what tends to happen is you get mispricing in the space because you don't have endless covering it because it's, there's no use for them to cover it if, if your institutional managers aren't willing to pay for that research. And then you end up with the mispricing that, that you see and, and hence the opportunities arise. So you talk about the mispricing and opportunities. So are there particular opportunities that have popped up now, especially given that the South African market has seen that real dominance from the um, larger players in the top 40 index? Yeah, look, I think there's, there's always going to be opportunities even in the large cap space. You know, if you're willing to, to look across the markets, you, uh, you'll find opportunities wherever uh, you may look. You know, the mispricing would be more prevalent though in, in, your, in your mid and small cap stocks, uh, just given the fact that, that your analysts don't, don't really cover yeah. as many of those as they would the larger. And that probably speaks to a bigger question um, as to how critical we need to be when it comes to actually understanding these companies and the markets that they operate in. I think of a few that were key favorites just over a few years ago, like Ellie's, even EOH in the last two years, and you look at how um, things very quickly changed. Uh, it seems as though it's not just about the valuation and the technicalities, but also really getting to understand the business environment, right? No, I, th I think that's exactly right. And also when you look at, you know, mispriced stocks especially, I mean, the way that you want to release value is you need that, pri that pricing 
something to, to revalue at some point. I mean, you can have a perennially mispriced stock. It doesn't help you as an investor because you can't exit your position at a profit and yeah. you, can't, you can't realize the, the potential gains. And that, that you know, you, you kind of hope that maybe one day, maybe a private equity firm or someone's going to come along and, you know, pay you a fair value. But that's not always the case. I mean, I remember looking, okay, Lonman, not really a small cap, but I mean, you look at Lonman and you look at the, 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 the true investment case behind Lonman when it was trading at kind of 10 Rand, 10 Rand a share. Yeah. And you look at just the value of rebuilding its smelter is, is, is way more than the entire market cap of the company. And you think, oh, this is, it's a no-brainer. You know, we definitely, you know, you should own this. There's, there's an intrinsic value there that you, you want to capture. The problem is how are you going to release that, that value? And, you know, with shareholders in, in London being as beaten up as they were, you know, it, the, the prospect of it actually releasing, you know, its fair value is, is, is very limited. And, you know, as soon as a, a, a private consortium or maybe, you know, Sabanya now comes with, with, with a semi-decent offer, you know, shareholders are going to let go and you're mm. not going to quite get the kicker that, that you're hoping for. So, yes, I do, I do agree, you know, let's go and buy mispriced stocks. Uh, it's very important. But I think Andrew's point on, on the coverage is also very important. So when you look at kind of the, the international mega caps, and I think we're going to look mm. at a couple of those as well, the analyst, co analyst coverage itself, you know, it, it gi gives a, a degree of, I suppose, consistency to your ability to invest in those companies and uh, and, and potentially understand what, what you're getting into. You know, the, the, the company management is kept honest because, you know, there's a, a good analyst community, you know, vetting the, you know, vetting the, the deals that they do and, and making sure that the stocks are priced correctly. You know, in the small cap space, you don't have that. That adds risk to, to these companies. Even if you've done your research perfectly well, you might not be able to influence management into making better decisions, which certainly does happen in the, in the larger cap space. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very different investment proposition. And I think when you're comparing mid caps to large caps, that you know, this David versus Goliath theme, you, you've got to take that into account. It, it's, there is a space for it, absolutely, but it, it's very different reasons that you'd go into each sector. And it kind of depends very much on the individual investor as well. Sure. Yeah, I think also you touch on the point risk. And I think very often people think volatility is risk and, and these small caps typically are quite illiquid. Mm. So you see, you know, the share price is bouncing around a hell of a lot. And part of the, the reason for that is, one, they're small, but also management tend to hold a big stake in, in these companies. So there's a very small free float that allows that, um, you know, the, your retail investor or private investor to, to actually invest in these shares. And hence, people think they're risky because you see this volatile share price movement. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You know, I think risk is, is you could look at it from a business risk point of view. I don't think volatility is risk. You know, looking at the management's track record, looking at the financial risk mm. of the business, what does the balance sheet look like, mm. etc. So when you're moving into the small and mid-cap space, I think it's incredibly important that you understand the business that you're investing in. You do the homework. You don't just, mm. you know, hope that you're going to hit a NASPERS. You know, like <laughs> if you go and invest in NASPERS in 95, you know, put 10,000 Rand, it's exactly. worth more than a million today. Sure. You know, that's the lottery type result that you might mm. get if you hit a luck with one of these small caps. And I think a lot of people you know, uh, invest in them for, for that exact reason. And you've got to be careful. You've really got to know the business. And what we know is that, you know, tomorrow's stars are going to come from the smaller mid-cap space, like your NASPERS. Yeah. And if you look back over history and you look at the top 40, very, very few companies have been able to maintain their place in the top 40 over a long time. So your large mm -hmm. caps mm -hmm. tend to get overtaken. You know, there's this evolution in the market. So if you're looking for that, you know, that big 10 times, you know, 10 bagger that people talk about, it's typically going to come from your smaller mid-cap space, but you need to be able to really understand those businesses. The big question for investors then is how do you find them, especially given <laughs> our South African market, because either you get a, a small and mid-cap uh, company that actually lists on the stock exchange and then becomes that 10 bagger, or these large top 40 companies which lose their values, uh, go through significant business uh, changes, become these small and mid-caps, and then are likely to um, bounce back and, you know, the rise of the phoenix. So it seems like a tricky <laughs> understanding as to how to how to get there, Gary. Oh, well, if you, <laughs> you <laughs> had the magic ball, you probably sure you wouldn't <laughs> be working here. <laughs> it's like, no, but it is, it is. I mean, many people, you know, they, they diversify their risk because they'll go and buy 10 or 15 small caps, you know, thinking, you know, we're going to put a little bit of money into each one. Yeah. And if, they, if that turns into nothing, my one 10 bagger is going to pay off my other nine mm. losers. So, I mean, it, there's all sorts of different strategies that investors employ. But I've got to agree with Andrew that the only real thing that you should be doing is looking at the fundamentals of the company, mm. understanding the businesses as best you can, and understanding the context that the business sits in as well. I think that's also, you know, when you're looking in the small and mid-cap space, a lot of these, these companies are concentrated either you know, in a specific region, they're concentrated in, in a specific industry as mm -hmm. well. And even though they might be fantastically run, they might you know, have everything going for them in terms of, of their future, just the disruption in the industry can take them out. Whereas if you're looking at the larger, more diversified businesses, that, that 
power just to stay involved and, and you know, have the balance sheet, to be able to sell off no non-core assets when you've got a huge amount of them, you know, to, to retain profitability. That's, that's things you can do in a large business that smaller businesses can't do. So yeah. it's, they, like, as I said, they, there's, there's different reasons you invest in each, each type of business. And uh, yeah, I agree that not all small caps are risky, but inherently uh, many of them are. So realistically <laughs> speaking, Google walks into your office and says, I want to invest in small and mid caps. Strategically speaking, uh, from a general kind of view, how much of my portfolio should be exposed to that sector? <laughs> 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 tough question. Look, yeah, I think that's a very tough question. Um, I think, you know, the small and mid-cap space, Gary touches on it, it's full of landmines. I mean, and you can even think, you know, look at some of the construction companies. It doesn't even mm. have to be the mid and small cap mm. space. You know, you take an Avenge and a Marion Roberts, yeah. which now firmly sit in that uh, part of the market. You know, 15 years ago, these companies were, were top 40 companies. Yeah. You know, these are some of the biggest companies. So that's how quickly the landscape can change. You know, to come back to your question in terms of how much should be, uh, you know, I wouldn't be allocating a massive uh, amount uh, of capital. You know, maybe there or thereabouts. I haven't gone and done the, mm. done the work to, to look at the, you know, <laughs> the efficient frontier and exactly where you should be or how much you should be allocated towards small limits, but I wouldn't be putting the or betting your house on it, put it that way. Okay, not betting our house on small and mid caps. We've touched on the South African environment, but are there opportunities offshore as well? Uh, because that often mm. tends to be underlooked. And as you alluded to earlier, many analysts don't tend to cover many of these uh, particular stocks. But is there appetite uh, for some small and mid cap stocks offshore? So I think if you, if you look offshore, and I mean, you think of, I know we're going to talk about a few shares just yeah. now, but you know, some of these tech companies that are mm. out there today, these companies have come from nowhere, mm. you know, in the space of 15 years, 10 years, in some cases, even less, you know. So are there opportunities? Absolutely. In this new age of innovation, mm -hmm. tech disruption that's, that's taking place around the world, be it in China or, or the US or anywhere in between, there's most definitely, you know, opportunities. Um, but again, you know, if you just go back to the dot-com bubble, you can think then, you know, all these tech companies, how many of them actually survive? Yeah. You know, you need to find that one or you need, or maybe it's luck, maybe it's, you know, it's, you might think it's skill, but it's actually, you know, skill dressed up as luck by, <laughs> by <laughs> investing in one of these guys very early on. You know, the majority, as we know, tend exactly. to disappear. One or two, like a Google, might, might survive. And if, if you get exposure there early on, I suppose your results will take care of themselves. So clearly go through these stocks with a fine tooth comb yeah. and uh, maybe some lady luck on your side. Well, we'll be uh, touching on many of these stocks that you can consider adding to your portfolio in just a moment when we come back from the ad break. Welcome back to Portfolio Watch, where David and Goliath is our topic for this evening. Small and mid caps versus their larger counterparts on our local stock exchange. My guest in studio is still Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Gary Boyson, Director and Portfolio Manager at Rand Swiss. Now, we certainly set the tone with regard to uh, small and mid caps in the earlier conversation, and quite clearly, a bit of luck is needed and lots of intensive research to really understand the organizations that you choose to uh, invest in. But we've got one on the list that we'll uh, pick up with, and that's Combined Motor Holdings. Tell us a little mm. bit more about this one here, Andrew. So this is a, a small cap business that has been around for a very long time. I think it listed in the late 80s, um, and it uh, sells um, motor vehicles is essentially the business. But I think the market misunderstands the business. You know, you just look at new vehicle sales, and you think that's going to determine what's going to happen with Combined Motor Holdings. Mm -hmm. you know, but they, they also sell second-hand vehicles. So when new, sales, uh, new vehicle sales dips, you know, second-hand uh, vehicle sales tend to sit up. So they also play in that space. They've got a rental business. And then where a lot of motor retail uh, businesses actually make their money is in servicing and parts. And, uh, and that, you know, obviously when there's new car sales are down, people are servicing their vehicles, you know, having to replace parts, etc. So very clever, multiple Yeah, exactly. So it's quite a defensive um, business from that point of view. So, you know, if you think uh, combined motor holdings, immediately the market sits, sits back and says he has a small cap stock that's mm -hmm. very cyclical because it's geared, you know, very much to the SA economy. But actually it's done really, really well. And if you look, you know, over the last, geez, you can just go back to 2000, mm -hmm. um, it's done superbly well. It, it pays a hell of a lot of cash back to shareholders. Mm -hmm. So if you had invested in 2000, you would have got 10 times your money just in dividends. 
sure. uh, forget about what the share price has, has done. You also so share buybacks, fantastic, I think, uh, at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. just, just put in some share buybacks too. So, I mean, you, you just look at, yeah, I just looked at the five-year charts of uh, growing earnings per share and, and dividends per share. I mean, and it's just steady upward, upward, upward traffic. I mean, in an environment that, as you mm -hmm. said, is if you look at pure new vehicle sales numbers, South Africa, you, you would expect this company be, to be, be slammed, but like mm -hmm. they, they are delivering the, the earnings. I mean, they're bringing down debt as well. They're doing all sorts of good things. But I think the, the point that I was making earlier as well is you look at a company like this and, and absolutely well run, you know, been around a great track record, but you're going into a world where I was looking at, I think it was a tweet by Michael Jordan, you know, the former F&B CEO. Yeah. And he was saying that, you know, buying a car today is like, what, it's, it's like buying, I think it's like buying a, a CD just before MP3s came out, you know. Oh. <laughs> and, and the thing is, with, with kind of like the, the move towards electric vehicles, autonomous driving, Uber, you know, all these kind of technological disruptions that you're starting to see overseas, how is this company going to react to, to those changing dynamics in the market? Sure. And that's, that's kind of where, you know, your, your large cap overseas companies, you know, I think they have an advantage there where, where local companies like this I mean they're gonna have to work very hard to stay relevant in a in a global environment that's changing mm. makes mm. a lot of sense and of course one that uh, needs to be nimble in order to respond to that environment from a management structure point of view because that's essentially where our confidence does lie uh, mm. any uh, amount of confidence or, or, or belief that we have in them with regard to making the right decisions in order to stay relevant as Gary's alluded to yeah so Jeb McIntosh is the CEO he's been there for for a very very long time he's a shrewd capital allocator We've seen it over many, many years. So I think, you know, from a management track record point of view, uh, it's superb, you know. And if you look at their, their profitability, return on equity is well in excess of 30%. Sure. You know, very cash generative. And the share is, is attractively priced, given that it's in the small cap space where, where no one really looks. You know, how relevant are they going to stay going forward? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a distributor of motor vehicles. So they're not producing motor vehicles, so they don't have to be you know, innovating, building electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles. Sure. Rather, they're just going to sell that new innovation on. You know, and you know, maybe buying a vehicle is seen as buying a CD just before MP3s. Yeah. I don't think motor vehicles go out of fashion anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> People are still going to buy them. You're just going to, you may be going to buy your electric vehicle. Uh, or Uber's going to buy an autonomous vehicle, or mm. a logistics business is going to buy an autonomous vehicle that can deliver stuff without a driver. Yeah. Mm. Motor vehicles will, I think, remain relevant for for a very long time. Not, not saying <laughs> that they won't. I'm <laughs> just saying, I, like my point is that it is an industry ripe right yeah. for disruption, That's and we see, yeah. we're seeing it with Tesla, we're seeing it, and, and mm. it, maybe not five years away, maybe not ten mm. years away, but 20, 30 years of, you know, time, the, the way that mobility, the way that humans move is going to be very, very mm. different to it is today. So, and I think that's one of the advantages. I mean, you know, a strong management team will adapt to, to the environment and it's also betting that the management team can do that. Exactly. Well, that's one on uh, CMH, <laughs> some uh, interesting views on it. What about master drilling? Uh, don't they have some exposure to the mining fraternity here too, uh, which mm. would not sit very comfortably with the average South African retail investor? Or would it? Yeah, would so, <laughs> <laughs> so mining, yeah, as you say, yeah, again, is a very cyclical, you know, industry that isn't looked upon favorably in South Africa, you know, specifically because of mm. what South African mines, are, you know, have gone mm. through and are going through from input costs, electricity, labor, etc., deep mines, we all know the story. But here you get master drilling, which essentially sells holes, you know, so they drill <laughs> raise boring, they sell holes in the ground. That's, you know, so they're, they're almost actually an engineering business. Um, but exposed to the mining sector, you know, but a lot of their clients are global mining companies. Mm -hmm. A lot of their business sits in South America with the likes of, you know, Billiton, Rio, etc. So it's not a, a local company by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. This is a business that was founded, she's also I think in the late 80s by Donnie Pretorius, who's still the CEO today. It's their RP. They've developed the, the tools and techniques to be able to do this raised ball drilling. They can do it horizontally now as well, so you can drill horizontal you know, uh, pathways in, in mines underground. So it's sure. a fantastic, from a South African innovation point of view, you know, proudly South African, this is a great story. You, you like Rand Hedges, he has a perfect Rand Hedge as well, you know, because they, they, they can sit in Fokvo where you probably don't even know where Fokvo is. I've been there. It's, <laughs> it's in the middle I'm of nowhere. I'm somewhere out towards the <laughs> northwest province or towards somewhere. Po towards <laughs> Poch. <laughs> and they can sit in Fokvo and drill a hole in, in South America sure. uh, through the, uh, the technology that, that they have. So it's Rand cost, but US, US dollar revenue. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect Rand Hedge. Um, fantastic business, yeah.
So okay. one that we're quite optimistic on. I actually want to pick your brain on Facebook, yeah. though. Um, oh, oh, you, you want to touch what on about master okay, drilling? Okay, yeah, get your thoughts on master drilling then. Master drill agreed. I mean, it's a fantastic company. I, like no, no doubt about it. Also. Again, uh, the concern that we had around liquidity in the stock price as yeah. well. Yes. So the management in, in Master Drilling owns what? It's 59% of, Ooh, of the yeah. stock. And it's got an institutional backing as well because it is a solid business, which makes it very, very liquid to get in and out of. Yeah. And, and that, that adds, uh, I think, an element mm. of risk to, to customers. Again, the criticism for the company has also been the e absolutely. Geographic diversification, wonderful. I mean, they, they do about just under 50% in, in Africa, 50% in South America. They're looking at North America. They're looking at moving into India as well. But the, prob the problem is it is very, very dominated in mining. And they'll, they'll kind of have a wonderful chart in their annual report showing we're very diversified across commodities. We've got copper and silver and we've got all these different mines. But they are very, very mining centric. And they, mm -hmm. they're looking at now trying to diversify that into other kinds of projects that are not mining specific. But 99% of this, the, the business is, is reliant on, 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 on mining. And yeah. now if you have the view that mining is going to be under pressure. This is you, you. You wouldn't see massive upside, or you wouldn't expect massive upside from this business. But and as you said, I think I think retail investors are very very concerned about the mining industry. For us at this stage, late stage in the cycle, if you go kind of back to the macro, this does look like a more exciting time to invest in something like master drilling. Typically, late cycle is when you see commodity prices starting to push up. Okay. Now they've already said the next year is still going to remain tough. They, as I said, they've gone through the last five years have been hell for them, <laughs> but but they've managed to to deliver excellent excellent results. Now, if you do get an uptick in the mining sector now and commodity prices start to rise, don't think in next year's earnings, but the year afterwards, you're going to see a real kick up in the stock, and then people can get very excited about it. But the problem <laughs> is how do you how do you enter and exit this thing as well when the liquidity is so low? Makes sense. Liquidity major problem on that one. We've got about two minutes for two stocks, <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> and then I'll throw in GE. Okay. Facebook yeah. first. Oh, Facebook, what, what can you say? <laughs> okay. Huge, Huge Goliath. Yeah, and almost, you know, collapsed when, when you know, data privacy became yeah. an issue, but then the market said, oh, we don't care about data privacy anyway, and it went straight back to all-time highs. So, I mean, this is a company that, you know, it just, it's, it's monthly active user base is enormous. I mean, it services like, what, almost, you know, a third of the world's population. Mm. And it's, 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 un it's an unbelievable success story. And, you know, if you look at how Facebook monetizes, I mean, you know, you're not a client of Facebook because you have a Facebook account. You're the commodity of Facebook. Exactly. It's what they sell. And then, and then if they turn on their marketing engines properly and, and they get those kind of marketers that they're targeting now to, to come onto their platform to, to start selling, I mean, the, the revenue upside potential is massive. And then you've also got like the WhatsApp and all the other businesses Instagram as well. Instagram as well. Very exciting. Yeah. Okay. Like one that we, we like and that we keep in our portfolio just mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't miss out on anything. Mm -hmm. GE? Yeah. So here, I think here's an example of a business that, you know, historically was one of the world's biggest business, if not the biggest at some point. Um, you know, that everyone loved and now it's fallen completely out of favor. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want uh, a lesson or do a course on capital allocation or how not to do it, oh. go, and s go and study General Electric mm -hmm. and see what Jack Walsh and Jeff Immelt in particular, you know, did over the last 20 odd, odd years. Mm -hmm. um, I think when Jeff Immelt, I think he resigned or retired uh, last year and the share price went up, I think, 4% on the day. Now that's, wow. that's a very clear <laughs> indication. <laughs> you know, typically you'd expect the share price to go down when the CEO uh, resigns, but you know, it's, it's a bad day for Jeff, but obviously a great day for General Electric when he announced uh, his re resignation. But it's an example, you know, that over the past year, it's lost half of its market cap. So it's gone from about 220 billion to 100 billion uh, market cap. So, you know, an example of gr uh, big businesses are not always safe and they're not always high quality businesses. And if you want to go and overpay for, for acquisitions, make mm -hmm. poor capital allocation decisions at the exact wrong time, like going and buying Al Alstom, you know, when, yes. when the market's moving to green or renewable energy and you go and buy, you know, an old en energy business in France that costs a huge amount right at the top of the cycle, you know, you will see a big company become small quite quickly. So key lessons to learn from GE from that. We'll have to wrap it there for today, but I think quite an exciting conversation we've had on uh, the uh, battle between David and Goliaths of the stock mm -hmm. market, but some interesting considerations to certainly bear in mind and, of course, uh, for us to consider as investors. I certainly hope that the show has been as insightful to you as it's been to me, but a big thank you to our guests again for joining us, Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Gary Boyson, Director and Portfolio Manager at Rand Swiss. Do be sure to join the conversation on social media and send through your thoughts on the addresses on the screen. Until next week, for myself and the team, have a good week.